Okay, hi everybody. Uh, welcome back. It's uh, a rare honor and privilege to welcome our guest. He uh, is currently in residing in Boston, where he's uh, received a prestigious fellowship at Harvard University. But uh, the man to my left is a national treasure of Ethiopia. Mr. Mulatu Astake. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, it's, it's absolutely a privilege just to uh, be here in his presence, but he's been so kind as to bring along a whole wealth of video and uh, musical uh, treasures for us to uh, take a look at. Uh, I think the first thing that we're going to watch here before we even get started talking is something that he brought, I think, that is going to illustrate some of the aspects of Ethiopian music and dance culture um, that you may or may not be familiar with. Uh, um, thank you for welcoming me. Um, how many of you know Ethiopia here? Okay, very few. So I think um, this film is going to feature our music and dance and costumes as well. So um, I want you just to relax and uh, see this video. So probably you can probably more familiarized with our cultures and the music. So um, as you know, Ethiopia is a country, actually culturally, a very rich country. There is about 80 different languages spoken in Ethiopia. And uh, maybe further to our discussions, we also figure out what Ethiopia has contributed to development of art and music to the world. So um, now I just... Um, actually want you just to relax and feel Ethiopia for the beginning. Then we'll continue. Thank you. So actually, this film um, were taken in Japan. Um, I had a tour. I have also have um, a cultural group as well as a, a jazz group. So this is the cultural group. Um, we were visiting uh, Japan and southern Japan also. So this film was taken in, um, in Fukuoka, south of Japan. Okay, now we start off. Uh, this is the music from from Wallo, like it's uh, somewhere in the middle of Ethiopia. So uh, these movements usually differs from the different tribes in Ethiopia. So again, this is uh, the Wallo dance movement. It's uh, mostly the northern part of Ethiopia. Uh, the dance movement is on the shoulders, up, so, shoulders.
also um, it's so interesting uh, by watching this cultural music, uh, the dance, the movements, uh, and also the cultural musical instruments. Because I think um, most of this development these days are taking the movements and the sounds of the movements are taken from these people. So I figure usually musicians or people who are really interested of listening music or researching music, I think um, you should usually um, listen to the roots of music. You should concentrate on the roots of music. So I think that's where everything is happening. And later on our discussions also we'll see probably uh, what Beyonce is dancing now and those people from the Bushish dances. So I have a great respect for Beyonce because it's nice to actually look those people back and get something from them as well. So it's, um, I feel it's so great because they are contributors and uh, as far as the musical instruments concerns also on the later we're going to see how the people from the bushes created the diminished scales where we when we learned here how Charlie Parker, Debussy and Bach were using these scales. So it's, uh, this is going to be a question. So we'll, we'll discuss about that later on. So now what you're watching on the film is uh, from Tigray, from north of Ethiopia. This is how the music is. Usually it's a five-four rhythm, and we have very complicated rhythms also in Ethiopia. So, you see, every region have different dance, different costumes, and different, using different musical instruments as well. So it's, uh, that's what makes Ethiopia culturally a very rich country. So now you're watching music from Tigray. Probably you could look at the, the moonwalk of Michael Jackson here as well. Here, we're trying to give you the picture of Ethiopia. So we'll continue after, after the films.
Um, okay, uh, that was from uh, uh, northern Ethiopia, from Tigray. And um, I don't know what you feel. Do you want to continue more by watching and feeling Ethiopia? Or shall we stop this and start discussing about uh, other situations? So what, what do you feel? Do you want to continue more now? I want to also let everybody know that you know we can definitely uh, ask questions uh, in the midst of this if you have something that you you want to know or clarification. Uh, you, no need to wait until the end and save it all up. Uh, definitely, because there's a lot of this that's new to everybody uh, here. There's a lot to learn. Um, so uh, if there is something that that you uh, need clarification on, uh, ask away. Don't feel shy. Uh, I have a question about uh, what we are watching. That is considered traditional. Uh, those are traditional forms of dance and music from different areas of Ethiopia. Is that right? Um, <coughs> yeah. Uh, well, we have uh, developments uh, on these musics uh, on the earlier ages um, where we never had a, a cultural group formed on this way because usually people, the musicians or those who created these instruments and dancers used to play individually. Uh, they never had uh, really a chance to form a group and play. So what happened was actually um, during the Italian invasion in Ethiopia, um, there was a place or um, people who were so much attached to their country, people who wanted to really fight and love their country, somehow organized a place called the Hagar Fickle Theater in Ethiopia. Um, then this grew up and that place become later a cultural center. So um, that's when there was one Ethiopian at that time, used to play a violin player, that's a long time ago. Uh, he had the experience of uh, uh, reading music and playing violin. So um, he tried to put uh, together a cultural group. So that's how we start. So that was the first stage of our cultural music, putting together as a group. Uh, then, uh, after a few years, and then that starts to develop. Our musical instruments start also developing by using pickups and things like that to the instruments, because before those instruments had no pickups, and if you take the instrument called the car, the one with the strings, um, was built with a, a gut. Um, so um, that doesn't take a pickup. So it was so hard for your organizer only to play because he can't be able to hear it. So the development was by using a pickups to these instruments so everybody can be heard and also audience can hear this instrument. So an electric electric pickup uh, was added to the instruments, the acoustic instruments, so that they could be amplified. Excellent. So that's what you've seen here. So we use pickups to these instruments, and that's how it sounded your questions. So that was actually our second development to our cultural developing, uh, you know, situations. So we have any. Any, any more questions? Yes. Hi, it's not uh, directly about the music, but it's about the dancing. Uh, if it could be easily explained how the eyes and the facial expression relate to the music, if it's like a narrative, or where does it come from, or what does it mean? Um, well, um, as I say, there are. Um, a lot of different dances and music and uh, braces, hairstyles and everything um, from the 
different cultures of Ethiopia. So um, sometimes it depends, like if the dancers are uh, playing for the weddings, for example, you see their expressions, their face, more, you know, more happier faces, more uh, different kind of movement and things like that. But actually it, it depends how the situation is, you know. Uh, but uh, usually, um, there is also developments on our dances as well. Uh, probably what you've seen here is uh, the developed one of Ethiopian cultural dances. There are um, uh, the, the roots dancers in Ethiopia, where they are you know, in different parts of Ethiopia also found. It. And uh, the way they dance and what these people are dancing it's a little bit different, you know. That one is more more traditional and more to the roots. But uh, this place, what you see in here, uh, there is a, a development. There are uh, also we have choreographers who come up with different ideas and probably tell them to move in different ways and that way and this and that. So these these are um, actually developed ones, but later we'll see the traditional ones as well. All right. Uh, can you talk a little bit about after the establishment of this cultural center, which I think you said was in the 30s, maybe in the mid-30s or so, uh, how, how did this influence uh, popular music? What was the relationship between the cultural center for music and theater and other forms of popular music, or were they one and the same at that time? Um, actually, both uh, went into uh, different directions. Um, how we start uh, modern music, uh, I think um, uh, I think the emperor was at about 50, 60 years ago, has traveled to Europe, and um, there was no any European musical instruments in Ethiopia at that time. So he was uh, greeted by military march bands and they invited him to a different theater. We've seen some operas and those kind of more developed uh, artworks. So when he comes back, um, uh, he was really thrilled and happy for what he's seen. So. He thinks like, why don't we have it here as well? So what he did was, um, he got some Armenians who used to live in Ethiopia and new music. So he ordered a few Armenians to bring European music instruments and uh, teach in Ethiopia. So that's how our, uh, the modern music movement starts. So the culture has different directions and the modern music had different directions. So um, after that, they formed the march bands and that march bands uh, developed later to a big band, like using four trumpets, four trombones, and five saxophones, and rhythm sections. So um, we had a a theater place called the Haile Selassie's first, first Theater. So they somehow employed um, European to come over and become a director of that uh, uh, theater. He was a great music composer, arranger, the name was Zell Wecker. So he formed this big band and uh, start teaching music. So that's how our musical, modern music starts in Ethiopia. Even though uh, he was a good teacher, but um, he can write, he can arrange, and also conduct a beautiful band. And those musicians were um, studying music from stock arrangements. And Actually, when we start talking about jazz, uh, in the stock arrangements, also there is a part where you really have to solo a 
uh, no music about it. So there was no actually a jazz soloist at that period. You just read the parts and that was it. Um, then after a while, uh, the development of uh, modern music, um, nightclubs start to flourish in Ethiopia. And uh, we used to have small groups uh, just teaching themselves somehow and uh, start playing more popular European music, but not sophisticated jazz. So um, when we are talking about jazz, it's after I uh, uh, finished Berkeley in Boston. So in fact, that was the first African to be enrolled at Berkeley College in Boston. That was in 58, when it was like a Schellinger uh, school. So um, I've learned there um, about jazz arrangements, uh, playing jazz, I'm a vibraphone player. And so I traveled to New York also. I had my own group called the Ethiopian Quintet, which we play um, Latin jazz, and jazz and this and that in New York. So after I went back home, so we started this movement, uh, what we call the Ethio Jazz Music, which I started in New York in 66. And it was so interesting. I mean, it was like, it was me and uh, Huey Maskela and um, Fela from Nigeria. We three were like in 66, struggling and trying to um, put Africa in modern world and in modern concepts of jazz music. So anyway, I had uh, different directions. Here we have different directions. And Fela have a different direction to that music. So it was interesting. So um, this is uh, what happened after 30, 40 years to really the Ethiopian jazz to be recognized. So um, probably you've heard the film called The Broken Flowers. So my music actually was featured uh, on this film. So Ethiopian jazz is now really flourishing. It's known all over the world. Uh, we're in you know, New York Times and music plays in a lot of different uh, places in the world. So that's um, our uh, development on uh, modern music. Uh, I wonder if you could talk about how you yourself personally became involved with music because uh, we were speaking about when you were a child in Ethiopia, there, there wasn't a lot of uh, opportunities for kids to, to study music in the schools. And you were fortunate enough, uh, or th as opportunity came about, you studied in England as a boy. And I think, uh, can you talk about how that influenced you? Um, I think I've been one of the luckiest men, I think, because um, in most part of the third world countries, music and art uh, are not really um, accepted like other subjects like, uh, which say physics, chemistry, or whatever. So this is our really our great problems in Ethiopia and the third world countries. But uh, in most of the developed countries, like you see music, art, and dance, are taught in schools starting from kindergartens, which is so great. And imagine how many great talents we lose because of that, because they don't even get a chance to know themselves. Unless they teach you, unless they give you the chance, you wouldn't know yourself. So this is the best part, really great, like, you know, most of the developed countries, you can see Europe, America, all this, because they give a chance to a person to know himself. So that was our really great problem in Africa. So me, 
I've been the luckiest because um, I had the chance to go to um, high school in England, in North Wales. Even though I wouldn't know nothing about my talent, well, my elementary age was in, in Ethiopia, uh, since we haven't taken nothing, but uh, uh, I really wanted to become uh, aeronautical engineering because I wouldn't know myself, you know. So I started knowing myself after I arrived in North Wales at the Lindisfarne College because they had uh, fantastic musical teachers, art teachers, and dance teachers. So what we studied, this uh, um, the music and art was included in our curriculums. So um, I was playing, in fact, uh, I remember taking a trumpet um, and finally end up uh, playing a clarinet. So um, this teacher was really um, find out my talents. He thinks I have a great talent. He tells me like I should continue in music. So imagine people never had these chances, like to know themselves. It's really, it's really very bad. Um, so I got the chance, and uh, I am what I am because. I got the chance to find out myself. See, um, so uh, this is it. This is how I found myself and become a musician. What kind of music were you really excited about at that time in your life? When you were just starting to your, your musical studies, you were, you were in England. Uh, what, were you, what were you listening to? What was really exciting for you? at that time? Um, well, after I uh, actually finished my high school, um, I was in London. Um, actually, I went to um, a classical school. It's, it's called the Trinity College of Music in London. Um, even though um, I was very much interested at the beginning of um, developing our music because uh, actually, Ethiopia was not very well known in music at that time. It's like 30, 40 years ago. I mean, nobody knows about Ethiopia becoming, you know, a musician, or nobody knows about that. And uh, I remember most of the West African countries in London, especially in Nigeria, um, Ghana, and those people really were beautifully promoting their music in London. And so. I was really, I was really, very much, you know, really mad and jealous about that because our music never been heard nowhere. So I've decided to uh, really listen more and uh, work more on our music and Ethiopian music. And uh, I remember also I had one Italian, very well-known musician. So um, I made him sing Ethiopian songs. We somehow organized the band in London as well. And uh, that's, that's what I was really very much interested, you know, to promoting uh, our music and uh, making research on our music because uh, there was nothing much happening at home as well. So it, it's definitely been a focus of your life, uh, this incorporating of traditional Ethiopian themes but also uh, you have introduced a lot of new elements and new orchestrations into uh, traditional Ethiopian music. Uh, I guess your time in London, seeing what was happening with the people from Ghana and Nigeria who were really doing that strong at that time, that was an inspiration for you, I suppose, uh, to, to try and bring Ethiopia Ethiopian music uh, to a to a wider audience. Um, yeah, um, really, um, I used to hear a very very great and very interesting music from Nigerians and Ghanaians in um, in England, and um, actually I was also 
uh, very close with the baby you've heard the, the Ronnie Scott he's got a club I used to know Ronnie and Toby Hayes at that time with the great jazz musicians especially I was inspired also by Toby Hayes because he used to play vibes and uh, saxophone so in fact uh, his vibe playing was also one which really inspires me so that was uh, when I was in London, so so when I get into Berkeley, I came with a aim of learning music and improving our music. So um, London was my inspiration, the beginning. And then from London, as you say, you you got into Berkeley. Uh, what made you choose uh, to go to Berkeley, and and how did you? What what were you uh, what were you excited about learning once you came to Berkeley? Um, uh, you know um, the history of jazz music um, and how the African contribution to that music is over fifty to sixty percent, and I think as an African, I have a responsibility also to uh, make a research and give also a place for what Africa has contributed. Um, so um, at Berkeley, I learned a lot, and I met really great musicians there also. So that's where actually I created this, what we call the Ethio Jazz Music. And we learned there of the histories of our contributions, the African to most of these developed musics in the world, and nobody seems to know very much. Nobody thinks uh, really, I don't know, not making too much research and know the contribution. So um, I thought like if I really make a study of this thing and make a research and um, somehow um, our contribution will be realized and given a place in the world, you know. So um, that was it in the Berkeley. That's what actually was really. And <laughs> listening to popular music at the time, uh, say Latin music, what did you notice? What kind of similarities did you notice between what you knew of your music from your country and what was going on there? Um, between Latin and African music, I mean, there is a great connection between these two countries as well. Maybe if you listen to the rhythm of Nigeria, Ghana, Senegal, and also some part of Eastern Africa, the rhythms are there. What the Cubans, they play, it's also been played in Africa. It's no problem. And that's been a good example. Um, I had a, a tour once, a long time ago, to, to Cuba. So my first question was to show me where the first African landed. So they gave me the chance to go to go there. So I sat there and uh, they start playing and dancing. It's, uh, the thing was only the language was Spanish to me, but the rhythms, the movements, everything were there from what I see from West Africa. So imagine like if you have a drummer coming from West Africa and the Cubans there, if you just count one, two, three, four, they just play, they just play straight. This is the rhythms and the music I've heard there, and also uh, I had uh, a lot of discussions with the drummers and with the dancers. So it's a lot of connections with Africa and um, Latin music, but probably what the difference is, maybe what we call the Montunos, uh, that is repetitive sounds in Montunos or Latin music. Uh, which uh, differs from African. Maybe 
if you go to the West, at the Eastern Africa, the Swahili music uh, have very similarity. So, but uh, in, in Swahili music, there is what we call the kikiriki, which is equivalent to mambo one and mambo two in Latin jazz music. So what happens is like in mambo one, the music tends to go faster and more exciting. But on kikiriki, the music goes slower. Other than that, the rhythm is there. What differs is the Montuno to me. So when usually when I think of Latin music, to me is is more African music. There's not much difference. And of course there is a, a lot of development on Latin jazz than more African music at that period. I think it was because of being closer to America and maybe a lot of Cubans living in New York, uh, listening to more to jazz musicians, to jazz arrangements and this and that. So it developed faster than most of African music. So w I, I believe your first recordings uh, that you made were entitled Afro-Latin Soul. And in these recordings, uh, you incorporated elements of the modern Latin sound that you were hearing with the Ethiopian melodies and scales. Is that correct? Um, yeah. This is just um, I was I was explaining before. When I think of the rhythms, I never think Latin. The rhythms being an African way I arrange. The only thing in my arrangement was a little bit close to Latin was the Montunos. But as far as the music concerned, mine is like Ethiopian music usually are based on five tones. So my music was five against 12. And it's not really easy sometimes to merge these two scales. You really have to be really careful and know your voicings, uh, your chordal progressions. Um, I think I, I hear some music like playing people like five tone scales and somehow uh, sometimes it doesn't merge it together. So you hear exactly jazz against five. So what actually I did was um, find ways how to merge the five against 12 uh, with not nice colder progressions and voicing. So that's how um, actually my music became very successful because it doesn't lose the flavor of the five tones. Could, could you explain uh, for those who aren't familiar with music theory what you mean by a five tone scale versus um, a 12 tone scale? Okay. Uh, most of our music now is uh, based on five-tone scales. We have four different modes where we write our melodies. Okay, um, we have um, what we call tzita, like if you take it on C, it's like you have C, D, E, and then you have G, A. That makes it a five tones, and we call that a tezita scale. Actually, it's been used a lot by jazz musicians, these scales, you know. Nowadays, they use them a lot. And um, then we have the minor ones. The minor ones, like it goes like C, D, E flat, and then you go G, and then A flat, and B, which makes it very interesting scales. So this is basically dividing an, an octave of music into... No, you, no, it's like major second, third, minor third. But you're moving mm. from, you from know, C to C. Yeah, from C to C. It, with five steps. Five steps. As opposed to uh, the do, re, mi, fa, so. Yeah, so you pick steps. up five yeah. out from the major scales or right. whatever. 
but it differs. So uh, we have the minority standing. We have another one called Bati, which is very interesting, modes as well. So that one is based like C, E, F, G, B, and C. Yeah. So that's that's a very interesting one. That's uh, that's called Bati. It sounds really nice sounds. And then we have the same scale with uh, Bati minor. C, then you go E flat, then you go F, G, and B flat. That's the minor Bati. Then we have Anchikoye. Anchikoye is based like C, D, not E, then you go to F, G, A, and C. Very interesting scales also. And then we have uh, another one which we call Anchihoye. A lot of jazz musicians love this scale also. This one is C, D flat, then you have F, that G flat, and then A, of course C there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a very interesting scale. A very interesting one. So we have uh, a minor of that also. That one is like C, D flat, F, G, F flat, and then C. So these are the four different modes we use to compose our musics. So this what I was working at actually using uh, different um, progressions and voicings to these scales. So what you've heard earlier, those two songs on the, on, on the screen, was based on these scales. So not all of them, for the first one and two are based on that scales. And when you first recorded your own music, your challenge was to incorporate these traditional modes with uh, 12 tone music. And uh, one of the things that you added, as you mentioned, was the Montuno uh, piano riff. Um, I'd like to play something from one of those first uh, records that illustrates that. Uh, the Montuno, so maybe. Thank you. So um, this, uh, this was done about 30 years ago in New York. Um, maybe I was talking about uh, not uh, actually um, the merging of the 12 and 5. See, probably um, this is how uh, the five stone scales actually been backed by sophisticated chords, but uh, the flavor of that scale was there. That's what really make it very interesting. It, it make it, it's, it's very Ethiopian how the Montuno used and the five scales the singer was using. So that was from um, the Bati scale, the one I was just telling you about. So we used that so, um, so nicely, it was a nice approach. So that's uh, what really is it makes Ethio jazz very interesting. Are these uh, are are the scales used to uh, convey different emotions? I mean, specific are they used for specific reasons? I mean, you would use this scale in this circumstance, or um, no? But um, what uh, actually the word was saying is uh, it's talking about the youth. Uh, the youth. Is not scared of anything. The youth, the youth usually moves forward. That's what was saying, especially on the choir part. Um, 
So that was it. That was about that, the song. Who were the uh, musicians on, on this record? Because you, you mentioned it was recorded in New York, and yet uh, was it difficult to find uh, musicians to play your music? Um, I had this group of mine called the Ethiopian Quintet. So this is the Ethiopian Quintet. I have um, friends of um, African Americans and some Latino guys included in this group. So it was a combination of Ethiopian and Latin and African Americans. Yeah, I, I noticed the guy was singing in Spanish at, at one point. <laughs> In, in the song, as well as the chorus in, in uh, Ethiopian. Yeah, um, and also was, uh, there was no much Ethiopians, like 30, 35 years ago. You couldn't find any Ethiopian musicians in America at that time. Now, plenty. Now we have plenty of them. So um, I, w I wish I had a, an Ethiopian singer singing that because to also could really play beautifully with the arrangements. Uh, but anyway, it was sung in Latin, and uh, the lyrics is um, translated to him, to Spanish. So that was it. It was, it was a good combination, I think. It was very bad. It was not bad at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it sounded, it sounded pretty good uh, to me. S the interesting thing, speaking of uh, vocalists, is that when, when after recording these records, you traveled back to Addis, and the next records that you recorded there were instrumental music. Is that, that right? Yes, yes. Now, uh, as, as I understand it, it was pretty unusual at that time uh, to have instrumental, a, lo uh, a whole instrumental record. Most of the music uh, was was really vocal based. Um, yeah, but um, usually when you actually try something new, there is always a problem and difficulty. So it was not easy. I had uh, a lot of problems to introduce this music, and um, also I used one very interesting instrument we call the pagana with ten strings which was actually used usually on church music in Ethiopia. So uh, I, uh, I remember once um, there was a play, very famous playwright in Ethiopia, and uh, there was this um, our very well-known priest who killed himself for what he believed. So this poet, he wrote a, a beautiful play about this priest. And uh, that instrument are also the bagana we used in the church. So by using the bagana, um, I wrote some nice jazz arrangements and using pianos and other instruments, backing this instrument. So um, we had a concert and I heard people saying, telling me to get off from the stage that I, nev I never remember. I mean, I remember that always. Because it uh, was a, a big struggle, so I never stopped. So I just keep on doing my Ethio jazz. Uh, in fact, uh, writing more for the bananas. I was just fighting everybody, you know? So finally it worked. Now nobody say get off. Now everybody now these days have standing ovations. So always struggling and uh, Fighting for what you believe, I think is beautiful. And you know, where if you jazz to what standard it is now, uh, of course, because of the broken flowers and before that in New York as well. So um, I fought and struggled with it and I had a problem with it. Uh, thanks God, no problem now. It's going smooth. <laughs> <laughs> so, but question? I don't know anything about jazz harmony, but um, the, the track you played from beginning to end, st uh, it stayed at the tonic, or I don't know how do you call it in your... <coughs> yeah. um, um, and the key didn't change, 
it's uh, stated the same key. And when it comes to modulate or transition, how you change the chords during the uh, song? I mean, between yeah. the scales? Uh, 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 yeah, I understand what you mean. So um, there are um, two ways of uh, approaching these modes. Um, there are the ways we approach them by using um, two, three of these modes by changing scales and chords. There's one way of arranging it. Another way is um, maybe on this piece, it's, it's a montuno. So usually on Latin music, it's probably one or two chords happening on the montunos. So this one, this piece was used only uh, with one changes, two changes actually. Uh, you know, um, but there are other pieces which have a lot of changes on them with this. To a jazz uh, changes on it. But even though it's not exactly jazz change, changes because I have uh, to use um, a different uh, approach to it. Um, sometimes I use classical chords so it does lose the um, the, the five tone feeling, and sometimes I use progressions, like half progressions. I can go to four, one, and probably just go flat five, and then six, one. This probably fits uh, better and nice to um, to these scales. So what you heard is uh, no my change. It's certainly it's like doom doom. It's one. Yeah, it's just even those chords is difficult how to approach them so you don't lose lose the feeling of that mode. So this mode's like by using C and D flat, then I have uh, I think it was like four T's like I I think C F A flat, C on top, then you go to D flat and back, you know. So I have that uh, the C and D flat the movement in there which really plays beautiful the scale because that was uh, the, the body mode so it, it sounds really nice so when you uh, returned and you were playing your music in uh, Addis at this time besides the popular acceptance there were other challenges that you faced were there were there instruments widely available at that time what type of bands were were playing. Did you have a good pool of musicians to choose from to play your stuff? Um, no, actually, I have to train musicians. I have to train musicians, and as far as uh, musical instruments concerned, uh, it's very difficult because uh, the taxes on these instruments. Uh, sometimes, a lot of musicians cannot afford to buy instruments, so that's why of a really difficult problem for musicians in, in Africa, in fact, in all Africa. So um, it's not only music, also for even the sports are taxed so high, you know, and uh, it's so hard to buy for musicians and people who really love music and maybe buy sports shoes and whatever. It's, it's, it's quite expensive, you know, so um, uh, it's, it's also, it's another problem by losing talents in Africa. Because it's not only the school problem, but also getting an instrument is another problem. Because it's so expensive, you cannot afford to buy. So that was one of the difficulties I have. Uh, not enough instruments, not enough musicians, trained musicians actually. So we have to train ourselves, those musicians, and. Uh, Somehow I managed. You also brought with you from your travels, you brought back uh, to Ethiopia some instruments which had never before been introduced uh, into Ethiopian music. Can you talk about that? Uh, yeah. Uh, vibes is not uh, very well known in Africa, even though it is found in West Africa, 
Uh, it has uh, different techniques and different names, but we have a traditional instrument which is very similar to marimba. And I feel the vibraphone is the development of those instruments. That's what I feel. So um, vibraphone was very strange to Ethiopia and also hammered organ and uh, conga drums. But we have drums also, but conga drums in different shapes. So this was introduced to when I went back home. So I went back with these instruments and somehow changed the arrangements. And, and also there wasn't much um, counterpointal work was used in our arrangements. So I used a lot of counterpoints against our melodies. Uh, most of the military band there was using a form, what we call the canon form, which is like somebody says something and then it's not repeats. So that's what we call canon. So there was used very much of a canon forms. And my music was um, using a lot of, uh, you know, high tension chords, you know, like 13 flat fives. And I used a lot of uh, counterpoints to those melodies. So that really makes it uh, very different from the others. What was the popular music scene like at that time? Um, what were people going out and dancing to? Were there, were there nightclubs? And where did people go? And what were they listening to? Um, well, you know, there were a uh, lot of different types of music, you know, because um, we have uh, radio stations, we have TV stations, so they play a lot of American music, they play European music, uh, they play few jazz and very few classic music then. So um, at that time, I think the popular music was like cha-cha-cha and bambos, um, and a few of, uh, like, James Brown was so popular, you know, that's right. they used to listen to that type of music. Did you uh, perform with your groups in nightclubs for dancing, or what type of venues uh, were you performing in? Um, I had a very nice uh, man called the, the uh, All Stars. Um, I have a group called All Stars, and later I have a group called uh, Ethio Stars. So the the one which I call All Stars was a very, very popular band, and we played very talented musicians, and we traveled quite a lot with that band. In fact, uh, my band uh, traveled at uh, different Sheraton hotels, and uh, played uh, in golf areas like Abu Dhabi, and. Dubai, uh, Djibouti, and Sana. So they had this, the Sheraton Hotel chains there. So um, I, my group used to play on that Sheraton tours as well. And did you, at this point, your music became, it was becoming more accepted and, and popular in, in Ethiopia? Um, certainly, yes, it does, because uh, I, I did a lot of recordings, and for Philips, uh, Ethiopia, we did, um, uh, there was no CD at that time, so we did um, cassettes, you know, and, and LEPs. So I did uh, LEPs and cassettes for Philips, and also there was another company called Amaha, who used to produce this small 45, 45 records. So I did quite a lot of that. So uh, really, my music became very accepted and became very popular. And uh, the band also became really um, good. And then I moved to different parts of the world, like coming back to America. I, and then, uh, so I left the band. The band is not there anymore. So um, since I was there, uh, we really had uh, a great time. And we produced some nice music. We played in a beautiful different clubs, you know. So play for weddings and things like that before, yeah. Uh, around this time, I think it was maybe the late 60s or early 70s, uh, the Duke Ellington Orchestra uh, toured 
Africa. Uh, did you have a chance to to see that or be exposed to that? Yeah, I think that was a really a great moment. And um, uh, Duke came to uh, Ethiopia for about four or five days uh, visit. And in fact, I was his escort. And uh, we stayed at the Hilton. Um, so I did, um, I wrote one arrangement for Duke's band at that time. And uh, really, uh, that was my great moment. It was one of the men we really respect. And we learned of his work also when we were at Berkeley. So that was really great for me to manage uh, an arrangement for Duke's band. And uh, it was performed in Ethiopia, me and Duke together. And one thing he was, what he said was, I've never forgotten, he said, I have never expected this from an African. So that was a great comment, and I really have a very good respect for him. What, what did he, what did he mean uh, that he would never expect that from an African? What, what, what did you, how did you interpret that? Um, I did, uh, I think it was very nice experimental work. So, in fact, I used uh, all the three Ethiopian modes, uh, especially for the trumpet sections. Uh, I combined these three modes together for the arrangement. And you get some beautiful blending, beautiful sounds to that. That's what uh, really surprised him, I think, because he wasn't expecting <laughs> that kind of sound, you know. And uh, he, re he really loved it, you know. And uh, uh, that was it. Great. Uh, I know that you uh, you brought some more um, video for us to watch, and including some. Uh, early video of you in experimenting with the uh, combination of Western instruments and Ethiopian modes. Maybe we can this is the first watch one. some of that, and yeah. and you can uh, explain so, um, what that's this about. So this the second film. It's um, uh, to me so 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 important. And maybe if you are musicians here, uh, I really want you to. L see and listen, uh, because this is what I was talking about, the the diminished scales, uh, which I was talking about. And uh, this is why I say always we have uh, to give respect to the people in the bush, because they are our sources. They are the people who has created so, so many instruments uh, so many nice sounds to us. So uh, I usually travel out to the out of Ethiopia, and I do quite a lot of research. So on this research, I found these people playing a diminished scale. So in fact, I took this film. I was showing it uh, to Berkeley, of the head of the jazz. Uh, um, composition department, so I played this for him and I said, okay, was it, uh, back a little bit, back. Um, I said to him, was it um, these people or Debussy or Charlie Parker? I said, I just want to know because I'm a researcher, I do research. So the guy himself was so confused, you know, so he couldn't answer this question. <laughs> so. I have a very high respect to these people. I think as a musician, I think you should um, go back all the way back and try to do a research because I think you'll find something very interesting, maybe even as a jazz musician. So on this film, you're going to see how these people, I was telling you, most of the Ethiopian part of Ethiopia, I mean, all Ethiopia, we use five-tone scales. So I was just wondering, how they can be able to hear this and how they created these scales. So it's so interesting. So there is three parts I want you to watch. One is them, natural themselves. And then the next part will be developing those people, the, the, the instrument called the mina, with other 
three tribes. There is another tribe called Are, which they play G6 uh, chords. And then there are other ones, they use instruments like trumpets. And one instrument is like uh, a baritone sax, all in bamboos with different sizes. So there is two different. The third one will be modifying this and playing them with Ethiopia, I mean, either orchestra, how it is developed in our concert. So there are three developments. So I want you to enjoy and I'd like to have your comment later. Okay, these are from the southern Ethiopia. They're called, the this one called Mila. This is how the instrument look like sitting up, you know, from small to the largest. This is how they are. This is the first one. Second one. The third one. Trumpet, that's how it sounds. Everybody playing. You can this is are they improvising here or do they have uh, specific parts that they're playing? You see, um, they have a part where each one plays. So the notes is like one after the other keeping the rhythms so they can be able to play only um one melody and that's the the diminished scales and they love this melody so much they are so much attached to it they dance and they drink they do fest uh, festivals and things like that so you can see also small kids playing this and the, the best part also, you see, so this instrument will never die because when you are four or five years, you give it to your son. Always, every they give one to each. So this will never die.
በድምጹም በርቱ ይያለ ያበረታታቸዋል አጫዋታቸውንም ይቆጣጣራቸዋል So he learns from his father. Can, uh, can the children choose what size they want to play or do, do you play what your father played? Uh, usually what the father plays because he teach them. Yeah. Everybody plays this instrument in that region. Everybody plays it. And but do they specialize in like if you play the the low note that's your that's your instrument or you switch around um but sometimes they do they switch around sometimes but usually one but if you don't like the small one then you can always switch to the big one you know, something like that you know. and they can only play one tune so we've been um actually been doing some experimental work in at Harvard now, this is what we do, especially at um, MIT. We've been doing a lot of experimental work, how this instrument could be developed. So there are two, three ways which are working on it now, and also on the cloud as well. The next part, uh, you're going to see how this instrument being played combined with guitars, and pianos, and other instruments as well. You can hear it here more clearer over the scales. ሙዚቃ so um, we're planning probably to build uh, small microphones to be built inside of these instruments. Uh, the other way, the other one will be to have three or four holes inside of this, so they can be able to play one or two, three or four instruments. I mean melodies. Sorry. Now they can only play one, and that's it. Now, the second part of it is how I expanded this. Make it.
I used to scare what they were doing. This the next one called the Array Tribes. They play jazz six. Very interesting tribes. Um, imagine now these people be able to build as they just said. So that's why we should have really a respect to these people because they are scientists and so on. Probably they are the earliest to be able to find these sounds and these chords and this musical, you know, whatever. So uh, I have a very, very big high respect to this piece also. So as we go along, you're going to see a very interesting instrument also here. The one which sound like baritone, the one which sound like a trumpet. Um, sorry, can I ask a question? Hello? Now, the Darashes, they've been backed by synthesizers. You see how this diminish fits so nice to their listeners.
now another tribes come in now. Look at this very interesting instrument now. This is, I use them as a trumpet. And these are the one, the long one sound like a baritone sax. So um, from this music, um, I hope you, you learned what uh, our um, scientists, people what we call from the bushes, are so great because most of the instruments you heard, they resemble trumpets, they resemble baritone sax, and you hear all kinds of different sounds, you know. And uh, I hope uh, probably it's your first experience, maybe, of uh, seeing this kind of instruments. Maybe some of you probably go to different museums. Maybe you find them in, in New York and probably learn some, some of these instruments there for the researchers, you know. I don't know if any of you here been there to see them, but um, this is how they sound. Um, probably uh, I'm working um, to develop these instruments. So most of the instruments you see here, uh, they can only play one note or one melody and that's all. So um, I hope uh, before leaving Harvard, I hope we come up with something very interesting and a developed instruments. So if you have any questions of uh, anything about uh, the instruments and the arrangements and their contributions and things like that. Uh, so, I'm um, ready. The piece that you wrote, sounded it sounded quite in harmony together, the, the, the Western instruments and the instruments from Ethiopia. Um, which skill did you use uh, as the um, bass? Okay. Um, uh, they are actually um, on uh, and, uh, diminished scales. So, like if you start uh, building diminished from G 
ไหลคง whole half whole half whole half whole then you get this curve so this is based on G but I don't believe that the African G. people were listening to Western tone scales when they found these or developed these instruments so do you think like our Western culture is uh, our Western music is coming from those tone scales instead of the other well, way around that's what um, really making this thing very very interesting um, it's a very good questions you know um, so what we have to see um, who were first like, since these people were uh, come to the earth to this world they're playing this thing they created this then develop, development comes um, I don't know who were first I don't know who who start bending these scales but we study um, jazz schools or more different musical schools like um, like I say, Debussy, more complex, you know, composers, uh, Bach, and also Charlie Parker. Uh, these people were using this thing when Charlie created a modern jazz. Uh, they used these skills. So that's what we learn. But how, from where, and what is what we're trying to find out now. If these instruments were the first, so we say, great to Ethiopia, great contribution to the development of world music. So this is what we're trying to do. You talked about uh, developing your research, your research in developing these pipes and these flutes, and uh, what you were talking about um, before put it, possibly putting pickups and electronics in them. It reminds me of uh, the Congotronics movement that's been happening over the past few years where uh, some groups have been putting pickups on uh, Mbira and Kalimbas and things and, and I was wondering whether um, within Africa people are aware of these regional differences and developments in the music like if Ethiopians are, are aware of what's happening in the Congo and if they're aware of what's happening in Mozambique or wherever. Um. It's also a nice question. You know, last um, maybe you've heard of the um, Mozart uh, 250 years in, in Vienna. So um, I went to Zimbabwe, and we have an imbira also in Ethiopia, but different type of imbira. We call it the tom. In Ethiopia, we call it tom. It's found in uh, Gambella regions. Um, so that was the only one I know, but I had to travel to chance to Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe, they call it Imbira, which is entirely different type of African piano. Uh, they have the bass on this hand, and they play the top of the piano notes up there. And also from my experience, I think from all of African musical instruments, I think Imbira is the easiest to develop because you can easily tune it to a piano. So what I did was I got seven Imbira players. Uh, I was on um, Peter Sellers, you know, not the actor, but the one who does operas. I was on Peter Sellers Productions uh, in Vienna for Mozart 250 years. We did the opening. So I took this seven, so I said, this could be a good present for Mozart, giving him an African piano, <laughs> you know. So I went with this group to Vienna. I backed them with the vibraphones. And of course, they have uh, pickups on it. It's some really pianos, serious. And uh, I remember me playing behind them the vibes. Sometimes there's the bass player on this, the Imbira bass player. Sound like uh, one of these Mexican bass, the acoustic guitars on the Mexican. It sounds really exactly sometimes like you know, I, I hear bass when I play, you know, really the Mexican bass. So, um, 
uh, we have contacts to some of the African musicians, uh, musicians who try to develop things like that. So I have these friends in Zimbabwe who is really trying to develop Embira. So we went there and we played in uh, Vienna, and uh, the acceptance was really fantastic. You know, people came and the technique was different, and we we tuned it with the vibes, and we doing something together with Imperial and vibes, and uh, it brand is so nice, you know. But um, we have contacts. Somehow we have contacts, uh, but not more. Uh, African musicians uh, um, more exploring, more doing research to these instruments. Now, this Mina, the one you just heard, is uh, something is really something really very interesting because it always surprises me how these people managed to create and be able to hear these sophisticated scales. It's not easy. So um, I'm really following it up, and uh, I hope it will work out with uh, trying to develop these instruments. Uh, there are two ways we're thinking. One, acoustically, by putting a few more holes, and the other will be to put pickup inside and use computers to use harmonies and things like that. When they blow, you can do it through computers with the small mics. So there are two, three ways we're trying to do it uh, with MIT we're working on. So uh, I hope we will come up with something. But there are, it's not only this, but there are also some really great African instruments which can be really developed. And, and I feel those are uh, the tribes, those people are the contributor to more developed instruments, I think. Uh, so. The only way we can improve is to prove this, is to really make research and research and research. So I hope to answer your question, sir. Thank you for being here, first of all. Um, I wanted to ask you about your transition from being an African and growing up with um, more of a um, spiritual connection to the music into European classical training at such an age and how your um how did you handle that or it did it affect you at all or you know what was your experience there? um well you know I mean most of these instruments you see uh, from developed countries the instruments have also actually have been developed and they're doing something really beautiful and interesting things on those instruments, great compositions and this and that. Um, and I know how our instruments were backwards. So I had this goal, why not this instrument be able to play like a piano? So um, the transition between these two it doesn't affect me so much because I have this aim of improving instruments, improving players, you know? And uh, from what I've learned, to go back and teach for them to study. So these transitions never affected me because I have a goal. So I always see forward. So, you know, I'm just it doesn't. So I always feel every day I learn something. So that's how I take it. Every day I learn something, you look up, you look back home and say, how can I do this there? So it's a, a beautiful and interesting life. It's always I just keep on going, you know. <laughs> You you mentioned uh, some of the unique uh, instruments. Um, there's a, a, a video that you brought, footage of uh, you playing um, the electric uh, piano along with some traditional instruments like the krar. 
I think it's called. Yes. Um, I wonder if we could watch that and uh, the people could hear what that sounds okay, like. Okay, this one is uh, also, uh, I've been trying to um, upgrade the instrument you've seen, the one with the strings. So I've been trying to upgrade that and uh, it was a bit difficult of upgrading that because um, it only plays five tones and two tones, four modes only. So um, let me take it back. So that to the beginning. No, back, go back. Back, yes, back. So, um, I said, yeah. So, um, what I did was, uh, we're working on this uh, at Harvard as well now. It's a great challenge, I tell you, you know. Uh, this instrument to be able to play 12 tone music. So I tried it in two ways. One was I somehow, I upgraded the string, adding more string to it without losing the shape and the way of the playing techniques. So I can only play melodies with no accident, which means like I tune them once and you can play something without no accidents. Now, the problem is if there is an accident there coming, as was the great challenge. So um, that was like experiment is like about 60 to 65 percent. Uh, I was okay, but not 100 percent. So now, how would I manage to play 12 tone music with this without changing the shape of it? So we're working now to sort of like work on mechanic, mechanical machines. We're gonna make only the top parts for the tuning. Now, this instrument usually, when you're playing one melody on in that mode, when you wanna go to the second mode, you have to stop and retune. So now we find a way, just playing these four modes by just touching a knob. That we manage there now. Like you can just press a knob and you change modes. You press, you change modes. You don't have to, yeah. But uh, it's the real challenging question is how to play 12 tone. <laughs> That's our great challenge, but we are really welcome to computerize it by bending pitches or by expanding the, 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 the notes, one note by expanding it by vibrations and things like that. So uh, we're working on, the, on that now. So uh, now I want, you to, uh, I want you to see my experimental work playing, um, I think this one is Never on Sunday with a crowd that scale. But uh, one more time, but this is also a very interesting uh, tribe, uh, a choir, but we use another, another one. It's, it's on, uh, yeah, yeah.
So um, if we sort of like manage to develop this, I think um, it will be great. So one the idea is most of the Ethiopian musicians are going to the guitar because they cannot do much with these instruments. They get stuck. They cannot go any further than five tones. So we're trying to develop this and uh, so they can be able to play uh, what the guitar does, you know. So this is what we're trying to do now. This is Quantala. Thanks, thanks very much. So I think um, most um, youngsters who are probably in music business here, I think exploring and researching and trying to do something, I think it's, uh, it's very nice. So probably this kind of work probably will probably uh, make you to go back again, do a lot of research, and come up with something new. So, um, you have any questions on that? Uh, we can discuss. Y you also host a, a radio program, is that right, in Ethiopia? Uh, yes. Mm. I had. Um, and FM stations. Uh, I had it almost for seven years now. So um, we play jazz programs. I have um, um, Latin and African program and their connections. Um, I have classical music and also world music plus Ethiopian music. So the idea of that uh, radio station was to actually um, teach uh, people music. And so they can get uh, more familiar from other musics in the world. And it was actually more an educational program than entertainment. So we talk more about uh, the different, and different composers and how the classical music is put together, the forms we talk about, and the jazz developments and its contributions. And we also talk about world music. So it was a very interesting one. So uh, I think um, it has uh, educated a lot of people in the country. What's the reaction been? What kind of reaction have you gotten from listeners uh, to your radio programs? Well, always you start something, it's uh, always a problem, especially the jazz programs, uh, which is really new for them for the years, uh, especially the soling part of jazz, which they don't understand at all. And they think like anybody just get up and blow whatever he likes. So <laughs> I have to just explain one by one about the changes, about the what improviser does through the changes, the musical forms, and this and that. So it took me quite a while, but uh, I managed to somehow um, a lot of listeners to get a lot of ideas to love jazz. It was so interesting, and uh, even the classic music, and it was so surprised, you know, I mean, um, a lot of people even don't understand about classic music, because classic music uh, also it needs the culture, you know, and it needs the education also to understand and follow and things like that. So. Um, since I said most of these third world countries, since we don't have that education, so music education in high schools, elementary schools, uh, it was a bit difficult for them to understand at the beginning. But uh, when you start talking and uh, try to explain and what is what, and you know, so um, it was so great, you know. And about 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 four after three years, I really start really have to have a lot of audience, a lot of audience. Then four years, six years, fantastic. So you know, so uh, I was really very encouraged because you know I was educating a lot of people, and and especially um, the uh, national radios 
usually stops about 11 o'clock in the evening. So mine goes up to 12. So like five, six, seven million people a day listen to my program every day. So uh, finally it became very successful and, and I, I thought I've uh, educated a lot of people on that program. So now uh, you've you've uh, received this fellowship. You're you're staying at in uh, Cambridge uh, at Harvard. What uh, particular projects do you uh, do you hope to accomplish while you're there? Is your is your term for a year there that you'll be living there? Yeah, um, I'm going to be there for a year, and uh, I'm writing a book on. Uh, especially what Ethiopia has contributed for the development of world art. Uh, especially we have to talk about our church music and its contributions. And I'm also writing an opera which is based on the 380 music composed by our uh, great composer called uh, St. Yarid. So, um, there is this, uh, the conducting stick, which was used in 380s. So we find out like um, there was no symphony orchestra in 380s. And uh, also um, the movement, well, you know, the ceremony usually, it's Sunday mornings, it takes about three hours. So uh, the priests, they use the sticks sometimes to rest on it and also um, to conduct music, especially when you have the feast times once a year, two months from that year. So that movement on that stick, probably you've seen it on the, the military bands, what we call the drum majors, the people to go around in front. So there is about 70% of that movement found on this conducting stick. So um, so it's just like the dimension scale business, you know. So, um, and also from the conducting sticks, similarity to the conductors of the symphony orchestra, it's only the positions differs. So if you just put the conducting stick like this and start moving it, a similar almost like that one. I don't know if you have the time, I can show you of that movement a little bit. So, um, this opera I'm doing is going to be, um, it's on this one, um, it's, it's going to be um, conducted uh, with this stick. So, I'm using a string quartet uh, plus uh, two electronic synthesizers included to the, to the string quartet. So that's one I'm working on, and also developments of the class of this instrument I show you. So I'm involved in the three projects, and also I do lecturing also. Um, there's so really great interesting people, a lot of scientists, a lot of great professionals, so we, Every day we have meetings and we present papers and we discuss about the papers. So uh, let's actually look at this. Is, this is how the both are connected. Imagine how his movement is. Uh, a little bit further, we go a little further. See, that's how we conduct. Properly. <laughs> so, <laughs> these are the combination of these two. So we're trying to find out if there was no symphony orchestra in 380, so 
what is what. So we try to learn from each other. So this is what we're working on. on um, we, we went back. These are our church. If you see this church is built out from one stone. So you out from one stone. This is the church called Lalibala, the one you've seen. It's, it's, it's so beautiful. It's built out from one big stone. You know, it's a beautiful architect work on it. Okay. Give anyone else a who has something they'd like to ask, a chance to speak up now. And uh, uh, we're going to uh, uh, listen to uh, a little bit more of uh, some of your Ethio jazz uh, as we're making our way out of here. But I'd like to uh, thank you very much for taking the time uh, to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.